Okay, thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's evening here in uh, Baghdad. I appreciate this opportunity to offer a few thoughts on our campaign to defeat ISIL in Iraq and Syria. I'll start with an update on the progress of the Iraqi security forces and the support coalition troops are providing them in the ongoing fight for Mosul. Then I'll give you a short update on our developing plans to liberate Raqqa in Syria. First, progress towards Mosul. The Iraqi security forces had developed a lot of momentum over the past two years. And now we're seeing that momentum continue against ISIL, our common enemy, in Mosul. The ISF are steadily advancing on multiple axes towards the city. The Mosul Offensive is a large and extraordinarily complex operation that the Iraqis have been planning for a very long time. They're the ones making the decisions, and their forces are the ones who will enter Mosul and raise the Iraqi flag in the center of the city. We assisted them with the planning and preparation of forces and have provided advice and assistance such as air and artillery strikes and intelligence to support the Iraqi operations. The coalition has delivered more than 2,100 aerial bombs, artillery and mortar shells, HIMARS rockets and Hellfire missiles since the Iraqis started operations to liberate Mosul on October 17th. This relentless campaign of strikes has removed hundreds of fighters, weapons, and key leaders from the battlefield in front of the Iraqi advance. Our coalition leaders and advisors on the ground coordinate daily with the Iraqi and Kurdish security forces to adjust our support because we understand their forces are fighting every day for their very lives and their freedom from ISIL, also known as Daesh. All of this all of this support is in addition to the substantial investment in weapons, equipment, and training the coalition has provided to the ISF to ensure they have what it takes to be successful. A few days before Mosul operations began, I attended the Iraqis' final operational briefing, where each commander responsible for a different axis of advance provided their plan to the prime minister. I can tell you that it was clear to me that night that the sovereign nation of Iraq owns this fight. There's a lot of hard fighting ahead, but we're confident the Iraqis will be successful. On behalf of the coalition, I want to recognize the heroic sacrifices of the Iraqi and Kurdish security forces and their martyrs and their families. It's good to see them pressing steadily forward on the battlefield, and we will continue supporting them until Mosul and all of Iraq is free from ISIL. Now a bit on Syria. Our Syrian partners in Turkey have continued advancing and have pushed ISIL farther from Turkey's border. This is a complicated battle space amid regional security concerns and adjacent to a civil war. And that makes for a complicated planning effort. We're working with our allies, our partners, coalition members to refine the military plan for the isolation and eventual liberation of Raqqa. While that planning effort is ongoing, we will continue conducting precision strikes to reduce the enemy's freedom of movement, attack their leaders and command and control, and their ability to battle space is crowded and complicated. We're finding that Daesh, with their brutal treatment of anyone who doesn't share their twisted ideology, is generating a willingness among local populations to fight them and drive them from their safe havens. This gives us confidence that ISIL will also be driven from Raqqa. Our coalition is committed to their defeat because we understand that de defeating them in Iraq and Syria is an essential step in, their de in the defeat of ISIL around the world. In closing, I want to remind the people of the United States and of all the nations of the coalition that their troops in this region are serving selflessly and with great courage in harm's way to ensure the defeat of ISIL. You should be proud of their efforts as you hope and pray for their success and safety. I am now, I know that I am proud to stand in their ranks. And with that, I'll take your questions. Sure, we'll start with uh, Bob Burns from the Associated Press. 
Uh, General Townsend, a uh, question for you about Raqqa, which you mentioned briefly there, and a uh, little bit of what you said was, uh, was uh, broken up by the audio, but I wonder if you could uh, describe in some detail the, the main ways in which the Raqqa operation will be different than the Mosul operation. Okay, Bob, um, I think I understood your question there. So the main ways that Raqqa will be different than the Mosul operation. Uh, okay, so the first big difference is it'll be in Syria rather than in Iraq. That's pretty obvious. I think secondly, uh, it's going to be with a partnered uh, force rather than the partner being a nation state's armed forces like the Iraqi armed forces. It's going to be our partners, our local partners in northern Syria. Um, so that's probably a big difference. Uh, it's also going to be done with a lot lighter coalition footprint. Um, we'll have fewer coalition troops there, less combat capability there. We'll have to apply coalition combat support in a different way than we're doing here in Iraq. And then, as I alluded to in my opening comments, which you may not have heard, um, it's a very complicated battle space. Like I said, it's, uh, there are a lot of regional security concerns that are in competition there. Uh, the Syrian regime's involved. The Russians are involved. Uh, Turkey's involved. It's hard. And there's a, oh, by the way, there's a civil war going on right next door. So it's going to be a tough very uh, tough uh, political environment and a security environment, I think, for our effort there. View on whether it's likely to be a longer operation, uh, given it's a smaller, I believe it's a smaller geographic area, <clears throat> would take longer to accomplish than Mosul? Okay, uh, I think I see what you're talking about with the audio connection. I, is that Bob Burns with a follow-up? All I heard was smaller, smaller geographic area than Mosul. Could you say that again, the rest of the question, please? Uh, yes, General, this, this is Bob Burns again. And um, I was asking you if you would be able to describe, in terms of the difference with Mosul, whether Raqqa is likely to take longer uh, to accomplish. Yeah, um, I probably don't want to commit to any timelines, uh, Bob. I, I would think that because of all the complicating factors that I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the ultimate liberation of Raqqa will probably take longer than Mosul would be my guess. Uh, we're planning to do it in stages, uh, to isolate Raqqa first, followed by an eventual seizure uh, to liberate Raqqa. But it's probably fair to say with the complexity and the fact that we haven't really got it underway yet that it'll probably take longer than Mosul. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next we'll go to Tom Bowman with National Public Radio. Hey, uh, General, uh, staying on Raqqa for a second, we've been told for quite some time now that there aren't enough local forces to take Raqqa. Uh, has that changed? Do you now have sufficient local forces or before you move with this Raqqa operation, you're going to still have to recruit train and equip more local forces? Um, that's one question. The other is on Mosul. Uh, you and others have repeatedly said that the uh, Iraqi security forces are on schedule. They have the momentum. Uh, I'm just wondering, if, from your perspective, what keeps you up at night when you look at the Mosul operation? Is it you know, possible political troubles with Turkey, with the Shia militias? Is it a humanitarian? A catastrophe with more than a million people in the city, um, or is it just getting bogged down, the Iraqi forces getting bogged down in uh, urban fighting, or is it all of the above? Okay, uh, thanks, Tom. Um, so on Raqqa, uh, I believe that there are sufficient local forces uh, already available for that operation. Uh, however, we have a plan uh, to 
do as you suggested, recruit and uh, equip and train uh, more local forces for that operation. So that's part of our campaign plan to generate additional combat power for that future operation. On your second question regarding Mosul and what keeps me up at night, uh, quite honestly, I'm so exhausted uh, that nothing keeps me up at night. But if there were something that were to keep me up at night, it'd probably be all the above, all the things that you just answered, all those things you just mentioned. Probably one more. Of those three, which is your most concerning? Um, I think that, you know, of course I'm concerned, uh, just like any uh, commander would be, and now technically I'm not the commander of the Mosul operation. There's an Iraqi commanding general in charge of the Mosul operation. But uh, as the commander of the coalition supporting effort here, just like any commander, I'm always concerned that we've applied enough combat power, that we've anticipated the contingencies, we've figured out in advance what the enemy might do, and we've got plans for that. So I'm concerned about all of that. And I think we've anticipated that, and it doesn't really keep me up at night. Um, the thing that probably, uh, pro probably deserves more of our attention than anything else in the coming days is what does the uh, security situation look like in the aftermath of the liberation of Mosul, and what does the political situation look like uh, in the aftermath of the liberation of Mosul. And uh, quite honestly, the, uh, the Iraqis are working on those, those problems. And there's a political process of talks and a way to figure out they've got an uh, overarching plan and, and how to uh, make that plan as good as it can be. But that's probably it. The aftermath is probably the thing that would uh, trouble me the most. And next we'll go to Barbara Starr with CNN. Townsend, a number of um, questions, if I might, here. Um, can you help us understand why, specifically, a lighter footprint for the Raqqa operation? Um, what makes you think Turkey and Russia won't cause you trouble over this? And this force that you're talking about training, should we assume you believe you, th that this would be a non-Kurdish force? So can, so can you expand on all of this a bit more? Okay. Um, I, Barbara, I think I got your questions. Uh, so why a lighter footprint? And then um, uh, I think your second question was sort of the composition of the force that we would, uh, partner force that we would employ. So uh, the first question, why a lighter footprint? Uh, mainly because um, we don't have a good presence, uh, an, an existing presence in, Iraq, in Syria, northern Syria, and all those complicating factors that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so here we have uh, developed bases that we've used before, existing relationships with the government. The go we have a lot of government of Iraq support uh, for our um, presence here. So it's uh, considerably more robust than it is in Syria. Uh, we're also trying to keep a footprint that's very uh, light there and um, to uh, avoid worsening any of the complicating uh, pre-existing conditions that I mentioned earlier when I talked about uh, Syria. So we're just trying to do it with a very light footprint and it's, it's pretty deliberate. Uh, I have no doubt that um, we'll apply the right amount of uh, coalition support uh, to the effort there and if at some point uh, we decide that more is required, uh, I'll flag that up uh, to my superiors and and they'll decide what we'll do. And this, as uh, to your second question, which I thought I heard had to do with the composition of the force. Uh, so there's a, a force there called the Syrian Democratic Forces, SDF. Um, they have an Arab wing, which we refer to as the Syrian Arab Corps. Um, that force is fairly robust, um, over 30,000. 
Um, and uh, a good uh, portion of them are Kurdish forces, Syrian Kurds, but also another part of that force is, uh, significant part of that force is Arabs and, and other ethnic groups that are from that region. Uh, so we will train uh, the forces that we need, and specifically uh, we're going to try to recruit and train a force that's from the local area of Raqqa. So that's what's made our, one of the factors that's made our efforts in northern Syria successful to date is we have recruited in each case, and Manbij is a good case, a good example of this, uh, we've recruited forces from the local area that were part of the assault force to liberate that area, and they form the core of the hold force that will stay. So uh, in Manbij, uh, there was a military formation known as the Manbij Military Council. It was part of the SDF formation that marched across northern Syria, that laid siege to Manbij, that assaulted Manbij, and liberated Manbij. Uh, now the Manbij Military Council has uh, secured the Manbij pocket. The, Securian uh, the uh, uh, SDF, or Syrian Democratic Forces, have largely uh, withdrawn from the Manbij pocket, uh, and the Manbij Military Council has stood up uh, the Manbij um, Civilian Council to govern there while they provide security. So we're going to try to follow that model uh, for Raqqa. That'll take a lot of effort and uh, take a bit of time. I hope Does this mean, General Townsend, when you say recruit and train from the Raqqa area, that you will be having uh, U.S. forces in the Raqqa area to do that training. Will that training take place inside Syria near Raqqa, as I think you're suggesting? Um, well, if, I think uh, actually most of the recruiting will be done not by us, but it'll be done by uh, our local partners. Uh, they're quite capable of doing this, and there's a, there's really, uh, we haven't found a shortage of volunteers who want to go fight uh, ISIL or DASH, as we refer to them. Uh, there's no shortage of folks who want to do that, uh, especially if they're going back to liberate their own hometown. So the local forces will do most of that recruiting. Uh, we'll help them. They're, they're actually quite capable of running their own training. They run uh, what we would call basic training, basic combat training. They do that themselves. Uh, we actually only assist with um, specialty courses, uh, weapons, leadership courses, those kind of things. Uh, and I don't think that training will be done in the vicinity of Raqqa. Probably most of these folks will be recruited by their means and moved or told to meet at an offset training location in northern Syria. Okay, uh, next we'll go to Dries Ali with Reuters. Thank you, General. Um, you described the, the sort of isolation of Raqqa is going to be complicated. One complication would be sort of this Turkish and T Turkey YPG um, sort of dynamic. The T Turkey has said they would not like the Kurds or the YPG to take part in this, but obviously they're part of the SDF. So how are you going to sort of balance that factor? And, and is the YPG going to take part in this? Or is Turkey going to take part in this? Because it sounds like it's either or from their end. OK. That's a tough one. I would use my out and say that our connection is garbled, but the truth is I heard the question. OK. so. How are we going to thread that needle with uh, Raqqa, with the SDF and, and our NATO allies, Turkey? Um, as you've correctly laid out the problem there, uh, Turkey doesn't want to see us uh, operating with the SDF um, anywhere, and particularly in Raqqa. <laughs> so uh, the facts are these. The only force that is capable on any near frame, near-term timeline uh, is, are the Syrian Democratic Forces, of which the YPG uh, are a significant portion. So uh, we're negotiating, we're planning, 
we're having talks with Turkey, and uh, we're going to take this in steps. And uh, we think there's an imperative to get isolation in place around Raqqa uh, because uh, our intelligence feeds tell us that there is a significant external operations attacks planning going on emanating central and centralized in Raqqa. So we think it's very important to get isolation in place around Raqqa to start controlling that environment uh, on a pretty short timeline. So um, we're going to take the force that we have and uh, it will, we will go to Raqqa soon with that force. And I think that the Syrian Democratic Forces, to include the Kurdish YPG and the Arab, Syrian Arab Corps, will all be part of that force to go um, in place isolation at Raqqa. What happens after that is still to be determined uh, between uh, our government, our local partners, and the Turkish government. And um, I don't know how that will work out. Uh, the Turks have expressed an interest to be involved in that. And um, we'll, we'll work through that later. Uh, but I think that um, we'll move soon uh, to isolate Raqqa with the forces that are ready to go soon. When you say soon, you mean a few weeks? I mean soon. This, the enemy's listening to this uh, broadcast, I'm assuming, so I'm not going to talk about timelines. Okay, uh, next we'll go with uh, Kasim Ileri of Anadolu. Uh, General, thanks for doing this. I will follow up uh, Idris' question. Well, you said there are discussions about in inclusion of Turkey in this Raqqa operation. Militarily, do you think that there are disadvantages of including Turkey with a bulk force in Raqqa operation? Okay, I had a hard time following that. I heard, I know it had something to do with Turkey and Raqqa and the operation, but I couldn't quite get the gist of your question. Could you uh, please ask that again? So Turkey has long been saying that they want to, they want to be involved in Raqqa operation with their ground forces and all other assets. But militarily, according to you, are there disadvantages of including Turkish armed forces in Raqqa operation? Um, I think, um, so yes, Turkey has expressed a desire to be involved in uh, that operation. And um, because of the uh, time imperative that I talked about a moment ago, uh, I think we need to go pretty soon. Uh, and I think that um, we'll go with the forces that can go on the timeline that we need. Uh, we're willing to entertain any partner not Turkey or anyone else who is uh, willing to go down to help uh, liberate Raqqa from ISIL. That's any partner that's willing to join the coalition and uh, uh, be a part of the coalition uh, to take the fight to Raqqa. We'll, we're willing to take, there'd be advantages to taking any partner down there. Uh, on, on Sinjar, uh, we know that PKK wants to involve in, in fight against Daesh around Sinjar. Do you think that it's going to make it easier for the coalition to drive ISIL out of Sinjar area if PKK take role or take the fight over there? Hmm. Okay. Um. Yeah, I've heard reports of uh, PKK uh, being located out in the Sinjar area. Um, that's a bit downstream from what we're working on right now, which is Mosul. Um, they're a fact of, if they're there, and I'm, it's not clear to me how many are there and what exactly they're doing, although I know that they were part of the force that kept 
uh, dash or ISIL out in 2014 and liberated uh, Yazidis in the Sinjar region. Um, so I think there are, if they're there, they're a fact of life on the ground and we're going to have to work in and around them uh, when eventually the Iraqi security forces go to Sinjar. But I think actually, you know, the, the force that's really going to liberate uh, Sinjar is going to be the Iraqi security forces and they'll probably take help from whoever's out there. Uh, and then folks who are supposed to be there will be welcomed back in to take up their homes again and folks who aren't from there will probably be asked to leave, whoever they are. Uh, next we'll go with Joe Tabbitt of al -Hura. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this. You just said that Turkey doesn't want us to deal with the SDF and you highlighted the role of the SDF in fighting ISIS. Is it, is it fair to say that you, the coalition, and Turkey are not on the same page when it comes to the upcoming operation in Raqqa? Well, um, the coalition's pretty big, 60 plus nations. It varies here and there. Uh, and pretty diverse views about how to prosecute the campaign. And uh, we listen to all of those, take in all of those views. And then we eventually make a determination how we're going to proceed. And I'm sure that there are uh, members of the coalition who uh, concur with whatever those decisions and plans are, and there's probably men members of the coalition who don't. So we take everybody's advice into, con into consideration, and then we decide what the coalition needs to do to defeat Daesh in Iraq and Syria. So that's what we're doing. Yeah, let me, let me, let me re-ask you the question in a different way. When I said the coalition, I meant when, it, when we talk about the coalition, we mean the United States. Uh, so my question is, given what you said about Turkey, about Turkey's demands, is it fair to say that the United States and Turkey are not on the same page when it comes to the upcoming operation in Raqqa? And I have a follow-up, please. Okay, yeah, I knew what you meant. Um, I'm not going to say it's fair to say that. I will say that uh, we may have differences of opinion about how to prosecute this operation that are coming up. And uh, the coalition is arriving at a decision about how we're going to prosecute the operation. Uh, we're going to go with who can go, who's willing to go soon. And then we'll, once we get initial isolation in position, we'll, uh, we'll look at how we prosecute the operation further. Uh, Turkish defense minister just announced that <coughs> Turkish fighter jets are ready to take part of the Mosul operation. But he asked the Iraqi government to keep the PMF outside Mosul. What's your comments on that? Um, okay, I think I heard most of that. So, um, Turkish fighter jets in Mosul. So, uh, we welcome, as I said before, we welcome any nation that wants to join the coalition, uh, follow coalition uh, rules, procedures, and direction about the execution of the campaign. And we welcome any, and that, and that have the approval of the government of Iraq. Every nation that's operating in Iraq today that's part of the coalition has had approval by the government of Iraq to do that. So um, if Turkey or any other country meets all those requirements, uh, they'll be welcome to join and participate. 
Um, then I didn't quite catch the last, uh, I heard an acronym, but I, wouldn't, I didn't really follow the last part of your question. Yeah, the, uh, the question was, the, defen the Turkish defense minister asked the Iraqi government to keep the PMF out of the Mosul operation. Do you have any, any, anything to say on that? Uh, yeah, um, so um, there, the PMF um, are um, pretty a variety of folks. Uh, there are Shia-dominated uh, PMF groups. There are Syrian, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, Sunni-dominated uh, PMF groups. Uh, there are Christian. Uh, groups and other smaller ethnic uh, groups of PMF out there. And the operative uh, kind of guidance that the government of Iraq has been operating on is to not send uh, any group of PMF to Mosul uh, that would not be uh, welcomed by the inhabitants, the, the residents there. Uh, so their plan does employ uh, PMF in Mosul, but all of those groups are uh, consist of local uh, fighters who are returning to Nineveh province and Mosul city. So they're predominantly uh, Sunni. Uh, there are also um, some Christian and some other groups, uh, small numbers of those, small groups. Uh, there aren't many Shia groups, but there are some. Uh, the other groups are being assigned to tasks that are supporting the larger operation. And this is all a decision of the government of Iraq. Getting to the point that uh, one of you asked me you know, about what keeps me up at night, it's got to do with the, uh, you know, the kind of the accept acceptance of this liberation and the follow-on political uh, situation, solution that's in place in Mosul after the liberation. So the Iraqis are more in tune to this than we are. And so they've decided what groups are going into Mosul and what groups aren't going into Mosul and they're aware of Turkish concerns and other folks' concerns. Uh, a lot, there have been plenty of voices from outside that have made their concerns known about what groups should be where and the government of Iraq is figuring this out and making the decisions. And so far, I think they're pretty good ones. With Tolga Tanis of Hurriyet. Uh, thank you, General Thompson. Uh, about this upcoming operation in uh, Raqqa, there are ongoing clashes between Turkish military and the YPG forces in Afrin, in Tal Rifat. And also, the Turkish president said today, if YPG doesn't withdraw from Membic, the Turkish military will force them to withdraw from Membic. So given the fact that during the siege in Membic, YPG lost 800, at least 800 militants, according to the U.S. sources, and all, in, given the fact that there are ongoing clashes between Turkish military and YPG in Afrin, are they convinced to join this rock cooperation without condition? Um, okay, I think I actually followed almost all of that except the last little bit. You, I, all your preamble I got. I didn't get, quite get the question. Say the question again. The question. Do you believe that YPG will join the Iraq cooperation easily while there are ongoing clashes with Turkish military and while Turkish president said that YPG must be thrown from Mumbich? Uh, are they ready to join this Iraq cooperation, you think? Um, okay, I, I think I got the question. Um, so, yes, we've seen, uh, in recent days, we've seen uh, Turkish Air Force uh, strikes on the Afrin Kurds, uh, and we've seen uh, Turkish artillery strikes uh, on the Afrin Kurds. Uh, we don't think that, uh, you know, remember in my opening remarks when I said this is a very complicated uh, battle space with uh, competing security agendas in the region. 
uh, and adjacent to a civil war. All these things come together right there between um, Turkey and Manbij and Afrin and Aleppo and, and that area. All these things overlap right there. And it's extraordinarily difficult. Uh, so uh, we just kind of point out uh, when members of the coalition aren't engaging Daesh, they're doing other activities that that's not helpful for the coalition. It's not part of the coalition. And we ask uh, members of the coalition to refrain from uh, undertaking activities that are not focused on the defeat of Daesh. And uh, as I said before, uh, we're willing to march south with anybody uh, to Raqqa, with anybody uh, who's willing to join the coalition, uh, follow the direction of the co that the coalition's taken, and to go defeat Daesh in Raqqa and start that pretty soon. Follow up, sir. Uh, just to be, uh, I mean, are you concerned about any fight between Turkish military and YPG in Manbij? And if it happens, can YPG join the Iraq operation? Okay. Um, so we haven't seen since uh, late August, I think, uh, Turkish strikes against uh, the Manbij pocket. Uh, that area has been liberated uh, from ISIL and uh, it's been turned over to uh, local inhabitants who are securing it uh, and governing it, uh, which I think is the right solution. No dash local security, local governance. That seems to me like what anybody in the region would want to see happen. We also have coalition forces that are there with them um, because ISIL is nearby and they're there to keep uh, ISIL from help the uh, local security forces, our local partners there um, from losing control of the Manbij area. Uh, we've, uh, we're talking to Turkey every day about what we're doing there. Uh, those are good productive talks. The Turks have not uh, fired into the Manbij uh, pocket since the end of August when our efforts to push ISIL out of there uh, converged. They were pursuing ISIL south from their border and we were pursuing ISIL westward uh, uh, around Manbij and northward. And those, uh, con those forces, those uh, pursuits converged there, and we had some uh, tense moments there until it got settled. Uh, since late August, uh, early September, uh, there's been pretty low friction between uh, Turkey and the Manbij's flight, uh, and we'd like to see that uh, continue. Martinez with ABC News. General, um, earlier you've mentioned the term uh, imperative a couple of times to, de to describe the operation towards uh, Raqqa, uh, particularly with respect to external operations planning. Well, what are you uh, describing there? Are you, is there something that's imminent that, uh, in terms of those external operations that you need to prevent, is there something that you can do in the lead up uh, to the actual uh, encirclement of Raqqa that could be done to prevent uh, these uh, external operations that you seem to be describing? Um, well, I don't want to characterize uh, the intelligence uh, too much here in this unclassified and public forum. Um, I will say that we actually aren't sure how uh, pressing it is, and that's what's worrying. So we're not sure. We know they're up to something. And uh, it's an external plot. We don't know exactly where. We don't know exactly when. You can understand this because you've been following these kinds of terrorist plots for a number of years and we're going to try to head it off. So um, what we're doing right now is a pretty much continuous watch and strikes in the Raqqa area when targets emerge that we can strike. And uh, so we're going to do those kind of suppressive fires until we're ready to mount, to mount an approach 
and an isolation of Raqqa. But um, there's, um, I think, a sense of urgency about what we have to do here because we're just not sure um, what they're up to and where and when. But we know that um, this uh, plot planning is emanating from Raqqa. Uh, not unlike it emanated from Manbij before the fall of Manbij, uh, the liberation of Manbij. So we think we got to get to Raqqa pretty soon. And until we can get down there, we're doing a pretty significant set of uh, suppressive fires that are ongoing and continuous. To follow up on that, sir, what, does this mean that you've accelerated your timeline for uh, the encirclement of Raqqa? And also, um, Raqqa, though it's the hub for these kind of operations, it typically means that they have personnel already uh, in place somewhere else. By taking out the center, how would this affect the planning if, it's over, if individuals may already be overseas? Um, I think I didn't quite get the second part of the question. I got the first part. Uh, did we accelerate our timeline for Raqqa? I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that, and then um, you can, if I didn't get that right, you can restate it, and you can state your second part of your question, which I didn't make out. Uh, the, so did we accelerate our timeline for Raqqa? Uh, no, I'm not sure that we did accelerate it. So uh, since I arrived uh, a little more than two months ago to take command of the CJTF, uh, we've had a broad plan to pressure Mosul and Raqqa simultaneously, or nearly so. Uh, probably a better description would be overlapping. So we're, we're pressuring Mosul now in a fairly significant way that you're seeing play out uh, in the news every day. Uh, and now we want to pressure Raqqa so that the enemy doesn't have um, a convenient place to go. He's got other places to go, but he's got to make some choices that maybe weren't his first or second choices. So uh, that's really been our plan uh, all along, and uh, we're still moving forward with that plan. Like I said, not really uh, overlapping pressure on both those two nodes. So I wouldn't say that we've particularly accelerated our timeline. But uh, if you could ask, I don't know if I got the first part of the question right or not, and if you would ask the second part of your question, which I couldn't hear. Thank you, sir. You did get the first part right. Uh, the second half has to do with you talked about uh, over, outside of Iraq and Syria. Can you elaborate on that? Outside of Iraq and Syria, can you elaborate on that? And if you go into Raqqa, which is the hub for external planning, how do you affect a plot that may already be in the works if personnel uh, who would carry out those plots are overseas? Um, OK. Um. So I won't talk, again, not real clear, but I, I think I got it. Um, I won't try to characterize uh, ISIL's activities outside of Iraq and Syria because I don't, that's, not my, that's not my lane, and so I don't pay that much attention to it. I focus on Iraq and Syria. Uh, we do know that uh, there's external plotting. And uh, for example, in Manbij, coming out of Manbij, we found links to individuals and uh, plot streams and to France, uh, the United States, um, other European countries. So we know that this is going on in Raqqa as well. And so I think that's why it's necessary to get down uh, there to Raqqa. We know that it's a, a, a focal point of ISIL, uh, external operations, planning, plotting. It's their capital. That's another reason why it's important to get down there soon, to take away the physical uh, part of their so-called caliphate. Yeah, so that, that's why we want to get down there. External operations plus is the capital of uh, the caliphate. And uh, again, uh, sorry if I didn't get your whole question right. So we're going to Lucas Tomlinson with Fox News. 
General, what can you tell us about fighters moving between Syria and Iraq, particularly from Mosul, leaving Mosul, going to Syria, Syria or vice versa, fighters going from Syria and reinforcing uh, Mosul? Um, uh, sure, there are fighters moving around in the ISIL-controlled territory. Uh, they've been all they've been doing that for the last two years. They're still doing that. Um, what we're generally sensing is uh, they're trying to insert. Uh, so we don't have a complete encirclement of Mosul. Um, that's not necessary to prosecute the uh, assault on Mosul to liberate it from ISIL. Uh, so the enemy has a way in and a way out. Uh, and he's doing some movement of fighters. We're not seeing large movement in nor large movement out. Uh, we are detecting some movement, and some of that movement was pre before existing before the attack began, before our attack began. Um, so I think he's probably sending some reinforcements and messages and supplies in, and he's moving key leaders and out, and we've seen him move some family members out. Uh, which I think is probably an indicator of how he thinks Mosul's going to go when he's moving family members out. Uh, I think that's what you were asking me about, to characterize the movement in and out. Is the coalition trying to strike these fighters moving in and out and some of these uh, maybe families as well? Um, yes, when we can identify uh, ISIL fighters, we strike them. Uh, we generally don't when we see a car full of um, uh, women and children. We don't. Um, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to see inside of uh, a car. So they've gotten pretty savvy since Fallujah when we saw entire columns, convoys, of um, ISIL fighters trying to leave in open trucks and technical vehicles in the column, weapons and flat ISIL flags flying. Uh, they learned from that experience and uh, they're moving in a more discreet way now. Uh, but we're looking and we're listening and uh, when we see ISIL fighters moving there, we'll strike them. Spike in airstrikes inside Mosul since the start of the operation, according to the coalition. Is that take away from the efforts in Syria? It, it appears that some of the strikes in, the, in Syria have gone down since the start of the Mosul operation. So my question is, is this surge of airstrikes in Mosul taking away from uh, strikes inside Syria? So, um, any commander uh, who's pursuing operations designates a main effort and their supporting efforts. And the purpose of that is to allow the commander and subordinate commanders to know what's the most important thing we're doing today. We might be doing several things today, but there's always a most important thing. And that important thing is usually weighted with the uh, weight of effort of the enablers and our combat power. So uh, we're doing a supporting operation. We're not conducting the attack on uh, Mosul, uh, but we're supporting the Iraqis' attack on Mosul. So there's a whole coalition supporting operation that's behind and backstopping the Iraqi operation. So that's our operation. And uh, for our operation, I've designated Mosul as the main effort. And so uh, accordingly, I'm pressing the weight of resources uh, to make sure the main effort is successful. Uh, so what that means is other efforts uh, will get by with some less. They'll still get enough to get their job done, but we're going to press the main effort. You can't defend or attack everywhere at once to be successful. You've got to weight that main effort, and that's what we're doing. Next we'll go to Corey Dickstein with Stars and Stripes. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, you mentioned that the complete encirclement of Mosul wasn't necessary, but for the, the rocket fight, will you have to completely encircle it? Um, and then, continuing on that, uh, do you expect a similar 
you know, kind of defensive strategy from ISIL for, for Raqqa with suicide attacks, IEDs outside, and then uh, a harder urban fight uh, in the, the city center? Okay, so uh, I don't really want to characterize our plan uh, for the assault, uh, the isolation, and then subsequent assault on Raqqa. Uh, we'll make decisions, actually Syrian commanders will make decisions about what needs to be done there to completely encircle, to partially encircle, to attack from this direction or attack from that direction. They'll make those decisions. Uh, we're, we haven't reached that stage of uh, the planning with them yet. Um, then, do I expect to see the same kind of fight as we're seeing in Mosul? Yes, I would think so. We're seeing uh, ISIL Dash fighting very hard, uh, pretty stiff resistance. Uh, he's got an external disruption zone. We expect a very hard uh, defense in depth in the center of the city, probably. Um, that's probably similar to how I would defend the city. So I think it's probably how they will defend. Uh, and they've pulled out no, you know, they've pulled out all stops. Uh, as you mentioned, suicide bombers and indirect fire and rockets and mortars and V-bids and all of that. I think they'll do the same thing, or similar to that in Raqqa. Just a quick follow-up. I know you guys don't want to talk about where U.S. forces are in Syria, but can you talk at all about what role uh, as advisors they'll have in that effort. Um, will they move down toward Raqqa with, uh, with SDF? And uh, so you're right. I won't talk about uh, locations of our, of our folks in Syria. Uh, we have folks there. Uh, the roles they perform, uh, they equip, uh, they train some of the partner force. We do that at various locations. And we have advise, assist, and teams that will accompany um, the partner force wherever they go to defeat Dash. And for Military Times. Um, General, uh, following on that thought about the force, the U.S. force in Syria, uh, um, you've described a, a level of urgency about the Raqqa operation, and uh, I know you don't have any troop announcements to make today, but I'd like to ask your thoughts on the U.S. presence there. Do you, uh, would more U.S. troops in Syria be uh, helpful? Is that under active consideration, or do you think that that's unlikely because of the uh, complex uh, nature of the battlefield. What is your thinking on that? <clears throat> um, I think my leaders uh, will ensure we have the right resources. There are my leadership is uh, from from uh, General Votel at Central Command to the Chairman and. Uh, the Secretary of Defense in the Pentagon and the Commander in Chief. Uh, they listen to our requirements, their requests, and they're responsive to them. So uh, we'll have what we need to get the job done in Raqqa. And uh, next to Tony Capaccio with Bloomberg. Can I just write a couple of tactical questions? Uh, there's been a lot of publicity recently about ISIL's use of drones, either armed or unarmed, for ISR. Can you put that in perspective? Have you seen a great deal of use, or is it just episodic onesies and twosies? And what is your capability with existing electronic warfare systems to defeat them? And then I had a follow-up on a different subject. OK. Um. I think I heard your question fairly clearly. Uh, it was about uh, ISIL's use of drones or um, remotely piloted vehicles or unmanned aerial systems. We'll, we'll call them drones for short. Uh, so the ISIL makes extensive use of drones. Uh, it's not episodic or sporadic. It's relatively constant uh, and creative. 
And so we've seen them use them mostly for reconnaissance and surveillance, the same way we use drones. Uh, we have detected them using them for fire direction in the past. Uh, by that I mean to control and adjust the indirect fires that they're shooting at the, uh, our partner forces and at us. Uh, more recently, they've gotten a bit more creative <clears throat> and they have uh, dropped uh, small explosive devices uh, into our partner force positions. Um, those haven't had, uh, fortunately, haven't had great effect. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and um, recently we saw an example of a Trojan horse, we think, uh, UAV or, or drone, where it was uh, landed in uh, our partner force's lines. They thought they had good fortune. They had uh, captured an <coughs> enemy drone. And when they, when they went to collect it and bring it into their lines for examination, it, it exploded and created casualties. So uh, we expect to see uh, more of this. Uh, we've put out procedures to our formation to be on guard for this. Uh, and um, our government is working really hard to come up with solutions so we have solutions ranging from electronic attack, like you suggested, to uh, kinetic kills with small arms fire. And we've downed a number of drones by a number of different means. Um, all of them with varying degrees of success. Uh, our government has recently fielded several systems, very high priority fielding programs. Other coalition partners are also fielding uh, their programs here in concert with ours and we're going to try them out here in the field uh, to see how well they work. And uh, we have solutions right now that can work and uh, we're trying to find uh, better solutions for this pretty thorny problem. Well, a different subject. The Expeditionary Targeting Force, the Special Operations Force that Secretary Carter announced last year, what role is it having in the shaped on the Mosul operations and potentially for Raqqa, would they be conducting simultaneous, if not separate, from Iraqi security force operations to kill ISIL personnel? Yep. So uh, that's a fairly uh, sensitive special operations force that we have here. And I'm not going to go into great detail about what they do. Suffice it to say that they're, um, we have such a force, and it's pressing the fight on the enemy. And uh, I like it very much. Thanks. It, quick, quick. We are no, no, no time for follow-up. So last one, sir. I know we're out of time, but uh, Paul Sony, I promise that's the last. Sir, thanks for doing this. Um, back to this question of Turkish involvement in Raqqa. Is it your assessment that if Turkey has extensive involvement in the campaign to retake Raqqa, that that would provoke some sort of response from Russia or the Assad regime, that there are maybe worries that um, Turkey moving uh, further into Syria than it already has um, could, complicate, could complicate the battle for Raqqa vis-a-vis -vis Russia or, or the Syrian government? Um, okay, I think I got the gist of your question. Uh, it wasn't completely clear, but it had to do with Turkey's involvement in the rock operation. I think the Syrian regime's uh, response to that. Um, um, I don't know. I hadn't really thought that through like that. I just know that uh, right now Syria seems to have their hands full. And uh, so it's necessary for our coalition to uh, move about inside Syria to, to defeat Daesh, ISIL, because it poses a threat to Syria, Iraq, the region, and our own nations. Uh, so, uh, like I said, we're, we'll welcome any uh, contributing nation that wants to make themselves part of the coalition to go fight uh, Daesh in uh, Syria. But that uh, 
joining the coalition has to come with not can't just just can't come with a whole bunch of strings. They got to be willing to go do what the coalition coalition needs done. And we uh, we try to uh, uh, employ coalition contributions, whether they be troops or capabilities. We try to uh, always we we employ them within the bounds of the wishes of their government. Uh, but once we set out what that uh, arrangement is, then, then the coalition employs those capabilities. And so we'll use whoever wants to go do that, uh, fight uh, Daesh in Raqqa. Uh, that's a tough place. Probably won't be a very long list. And I would imagine that Syria probably isn't thrilled with any of us there doing that. But it's necessary to do. I'm sorry we've gone over time. Appreciate your time today in briefing us, uh, and we uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening.